This is improving every year, but we will we still have a long way to go in understanding the disease. And every individual responds uniquely to the disease and its treatment. So in addition, ethnicity, lifestyle, environment have a significant role to play. We in India need to build our own data sets so that we can find our own set of protocols to treat our own people. And we must not completely be reliant on non-Indian research for our protocol. And data is uh, really critical for this research. And we must find collaborative data platforms to, for research at the national level. And I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to bring in four amazing speakers to join us today and think a little bit about how data can be, data and research can go together in terms of addressing some of the diabetes related problems. Uh, before I get started and introduce the speakers, let me a little bit share with you how we plan to run the session today. So we have a total of 90 minutes. I know we lost eight, about 8 to 10 minutes, but we will still try to end in time so that the next session can start on time. Uh, in the first 10 to 15 minutes, I want to in, introduce the speakers and invite them to share a little bit about their personal research agenda and how they look at some of these problems. We have some very eminent ones here. And just to make it easier, I'm going to introduce the speaker very briefly and let them answer it rather than introducing all four of you at the same time. So that's my plan today. And after I'm done with that, then we will go through uh, basically a simple, why is this research important? What kind of research are we looking at? How do we go about doing it? And then finally conclude by what is now and what can be done in the future. Uh, we have an interesting panel mix here. We have two medical doctors, which would be Dr. Callum McRae and Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. And we have two engineers, computer science people, which would be Kash Patel and Dr. Ramesh Jain. So we have a very interesting panel. All of these people I've worked with before, and I'm really delighted to invite friends to these kinds of things. So I know it's, it's always good to have you all here. Uh, so thank you first for being on this panel, and we have Callum and uh, Cash joining in from the east coast of the U.S., so it's pretty late for them on the uh, 5th of August, but uh, Ramesh and I are both in California right now. So I'm going to start with Callum and give a very brief introduction. So Callum McRae uh, is the Vice Chair of, for Scientific Innovation at the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and an expert member of BWH's cardiac, cardiovascular genetics program, which comprehensively evaluates, diagnoses, and manages care for inherited cardiac disorder patients. In addition, he is a leading investigator at the BWH Genomics Center, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard. He has received his medical degree from the University of Edinburgh College of Medicine. He completed two internal medicine residencies and uh, is very well known uh, in the research community as well. Uh, one important fact I want to mention here is that in October 2016, the American Heart Association, Verily Life Sciences and AstraZeneca announced that Dr. Callum McRae as the leader of the One Brave Initiative. He beat out hundreds of other applicants from around the world to receive a landmark award to provide support over a five-year period for research projects focused on uncovering that the cause of heart disease and including prevent previously unrecognized signals. He's also the founder of Atman Health and Atman is on a mission to help providers and patients create, carry out state of the art personal care plans to manage chronic diseases. So, you know, it's a real honor to have you Callum here. And I, let me invite you to share a little bit about the kind of research you are working on so that we can set the context of the discussion for the future. Well, thanks very much, Anand, for the invitation to speak. It's an honor for me to be uh, present in this panel and at the, the uh, symposium. Uh, we've been working for the last uh, 10 to 15 years on this interface between uh, existing care, um, early discovery, and innovation. How do we get uh, new insights into the clinic in a timeline that's consistent with every other industry? And so part of what we've been doing is working with uh, technology companies like Apple and Google, um, and really trying to think about how we can accelerate that transition, use a combination of software uh, and uh, hardware to begin to bring together the data and the insights necessary to actually deliver what we know already works uh, at scale, uh, at low cost, so that everybody really can have the same standard of care wherever they are in the world. And so that's essentially what I've been working on for the, the last decade. And you know 
uh, from the work we've been doing with Persistent uh, and subsequent work that we've done uh, with Atman Health, that we've really been focused on that interface and trying to get everybody uh, on the planet really um, uh, cared for at the same level. And it's an exciting mission and one that I believe this uh, this panel is going to discuss in some detail over the next 90 minutes and deeply uh, uh, honored and pleased to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Callum. And uh, as you would, as Sanjay mentioned, we have a large number of people attending this conference. And as you are aware, India has a very large population that needs the kind of help that you provide. So I'm really hoping that uh, this is not just an event, but also the start of a potential collaboration that we could take on for the future as well. So let me now invite my dear friend Ramesh Chen. Ramesh and I go a long way. We have known each other for more than 30 years. Ramesh is the Donald Bren Professor of Computer Science at the University of California in Irvine. Ramesh is a very well-known researcher in computer vision, databases, multimedia systems. And more recently, he has focused his energy on research in the areas of healthcare devices, data. And he is also the founder of UCI's Institute of Future Health. So Ramesh has a wide diverse experience and a strong computer science background. I'm going to invite Ramesh to share a bit about his research and what he's doing in the diabetes care related program to just get the context going. Ramesh. Thank you very much, Anand. My life had been all about data. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, control theory. Uh, that time, uh, digital control systems were coming. So I started dealing with digital data right from that time, went to uh, AI, computer vision, multimedia, and different types of things uh, that uh, Anand mentioned. Uh, about 10 years ago, a uh, little more than 10 years ago, I jumped into health. And uh, that was a very brave jump on my part because as uh, most of the audience knows in India, if you go to engineering, you don't study biology. So I had no knowledge of health, no knowledge of biology, and I decided that I'm going to focus on health. So last uh, decade has been uh, possibly the most uh, active decade for me in terms of learning. Uh, both in terms of uh, what the traditional things are, what direction things are going, and so on. And uh, more I talk to my friends from the medical or health side, uh, more I got excited about lots of things that the data can do in all these things. And uh, one thing led to other, and I realized that uh, there are some very important lessons. Number one, I learned that uh, data is the lifeblood of health. Data is everywhere. Uh, in fact, uh, data is the most common element that can sense health. So uh, that started encouraging me to look more and more into this. And uh, it became clear that longitudinal data in the form of streams coming from multimedia from many different sources uh, is going to play extremely important role in understanding uh, what is going on in the health area. The second thing that I learned and which was uh, mentioned uh, by uh, both the Dr. McCray and uh, Anand also, that uh, every person is unique. And that's why all this, uh, uh, our traditional model that are mostly based on population are not valid at individual level. They need significant modifications. We need to understand each person very significantly. And uh, as we all know, uh, if we want to build a model uh, in every branch of science or engineering, we have to collect data about input output behavior. That, and this data, more data we have, better the models are. The next important thing that I learned is that uh, because of resource limitations and because of our knowledge limitations, medicine has become completely episodic uh, medicine. That means uh, when we need, when we are sick, then only we go to doctors. Uh, and that time, uh, medicine works in the repair mode more than anything else. The goal is to repair what is wrong there. Uh, and that's why you hear all the time that uh, it deals with symptoms, not with the causes. 
And now if we want to deal with that, then we have to consider it uh, health to be a journey rather than episodes. And if we start considering it a journey, then it becomes very interesting. And I got fascinated by thinking about navigation systems. All of us, use, we use navigation system to go from point A to point B. And the beauty of navigation system is all the knowledge and all the processing that's going on is completely hidden from the user. It is just keeps on telling you, go turn left, turn right in 100 meters. This is what you will have to do and so on. And I started thinking, why can't we do this for uh, health? Particularly because when we start thinking about uh, this kind of uh, model, uh, much of the knowledge is going to be really in clouds. And uh, much of the information that we require to guide a person is coming from their uh, mobile phone and wearable devices and all other uh, uh, kind of places. So it became clear to me that if we use the navigational model, this will be very, very important. And uh, that's why uh, I'm spending all my time, in fact, uh, uh, almost complete my time in trying to understand how to build these models effectively and how do we apply these to all kinds of chronic diseases, in particular diabetes because of my friendship with one of my uh, colleagues here. And uh, so that, that's what we have been doing. One last thing that I want to mention is healthcare is uses very different models in different countries. Uh, it is very difficult to change healthcare models in countries like uh, United States because uh, it has very strong legacy. It is entrenched business interest and lots of other factors that make it very difficult to change anything. But we all saw that uh, things like mobile phone brought in a major revolution. Things like internet brought in a major revolution. I think now the major revolution is going to come in the area of health and it's going to start in countries like India. And from there, it will come back to United States rather than we copying in, in India, copying United States. So we have a great opportunity where we can start introducing new models that can be adopted all over the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ramesh. This was very useful. And uh, I must point out that I saw your demo of Dynavi last week, and it was amazing. And I'm really looking forward to setting this up as a potential collaboration for Indian doctors who are attending this session. So let me now move to Cash Patel, who again is a friend for many years. Cash is the Vice President and Digital Information Officer, EVP at uh, the Hackensack Meridian Health Center in uh, New Jersey. Prior to this, he used to be the Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of Penn Medicine, and also previously Vice President Population Health and Analytics at uh, Mount Sinai Health System. So someone who is very familiar with the US health systems, data, technology, and all of those kinds of things. And Cash, uh, could you maybe add some of your experience and what you're doing on this stuff topic? Sure. Oh, thank you for um, inviting me on this uh, panel. Um, great, uh, great uh, set of guests on the panel too. Just make remiss, I'm a, an engineer by trade. Um, control engineering happens to be, and uh, you know, I love that uh, part of my sort of background. I, uh, instead of moving to the hardware world, sort of shifted into into the world of software on 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 uh, commercial solu solutions all around data. Um, and then my sort of first foray into healthcare was in uh, about 20 years ago at Mount Sinai. I walked in the door, and, and this is sort of relevant to sort of what we're talking about in data, is um, I was thinking that it can't be just complicated. It's simple. It's like a hotel. You check in. You, you have patients, the procedures. You order stuff, and you're done, right? And so from a data complexity perspective, I thought I was going to be there for like a month and building their analytics environment, et cetera, et cetera. I ended up being there for about just about 15 years and built the, uh, the data analytics environment at Mount Sinai, which is now um, over you know two billion dollars of grants have been attributed to us. What I've learned from that journey is data is really complicated in healthcare. Um, you know, as soon as a human person touches the data, it just changes. 
Um, unfortunately, I'd say America with the electronic health record system, they're really designed for billing purposes and not designed to sort of clean data collection. And we'll talk about this in a second today about some of the things that we can do. Um, lots of, you know, uh, lots of support around analytics and data and research. Um, and then my, my stint at Penn was um, similar. I ran a school of medicine at Penn, Penn Medicine, which is another prestigious university here in the States. Um, did a lot of work around um, genomics and integrating genomics with the phenotypes, um, helped for the um, ILIT project over there, which is related to, to diabetes care, right? The ILIT transplant, uh, which is um, you know, now now FDA approved, and some patients were just beginning to be seen at, uh, at Penn when I was there. So, um, and part of my journey at Hackensack, now that I sort of run all of IT at New Jersey's largest health system, I now get an opportunity to take, take lessons learned, and, and now I have the budget and the control and the people, right? And so now I have sort of the best of what I'm looking for. Is we are embarking on a vision to, to build a, a federated sort of model around data. We're the first health system nationally to standardize on Google, um, which means that we're on Google everything, right? We're on Chromebooks, we run our electronic health record systems on Chromebooks, right? When all our data is sitting on Google, we have really tight relationships. And the intent here, and I'm really um, happy for this discussion, is to start to build relationships with, with um, you know, the community in India, especially to build an alliance to, to create a federated model to start to share data. So we're, we're doing the engineering, we're doing the de-identification, we're thinking about the protection of data, we're thinking about who owns the, the rights to the data, and then how do you share it in sort of safe manners, um, um, or in, in, in sort of data enclaves with tokenization and some other technologies. So, more to come about how we're doing, but um, I'm really um, keen to sort of learn from, from the discussion as well. Great, uh, Cash. Uh, we're going to come back to some of the topics you mentioned, and you have set it up very nicely for what we need to do together on this topic. Uh, let me now invite uh, our fellow panelists and moderator, uh, and also a local organizer of this event, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, who is also of course, he's a medical doctor, MD, FACE, FACP. He's also the fellow of American College of Endocrinology, um, director of the Agley Clinic, diabetes care head of medicine at uh, Ruby Hall. He's also on the, as an associate editor of the International Journal of Diabetes in Developing Countries, honorary secretary of the governing council of National RSSDI and chairman of IDEC, which is what we are hosting here. So we have someone who really understands this thing. And I'm going to get uh, uh, Sanjay to play multiple roles here. One is, of course, he's going to represent the, the community of audience who is attending this conference, but also I'm going to try to push him into suggesting how can we work together to make these kinds of things happen, Sanjay? Sanjay, uh, we cannot hear you very well. Uh, can you ask the people in your room to not speak while you're speaking? See, there is somebody else speaking also on that line, perhaps. Uh, I think we have two microphones and it's echoing in the same microphone. Yeah, see, so Sanjay, I think there may be two microphones. There is somebody else who has a parallel microphone where they are trying to debug the system. So that's probably what's causing this problem. Uh, but anyway, we'll come back to you, Sanjay. We'll, I'm going to mute you. Uh, if you can go mute for a moment, we'll, we'll come back to you, Sanjay. We'll fix that problem from that side. All right. Um, hopefully, people on YouTube can hear us very well. So let's keep moving. Uh, let me now move to the next part of this thing where I wanted to focus on the 
the why, why do we need to do research? Some of you mentioned the importance of personalized medicine and uh, the whole focus around the fact that, you know, it's not enough that we have, we have, we have been studying diabetes for more than 100 years, I'm sure. And everyone has probably figured out what needs to get done. Are we done or is there more to do research on? So if you can get Callum to you to start about the importance of research and why we need to continue to be researching this topic and how it's a hard problem. Can you set, explain a little bit about how hard the problem is really for us to work on? Sure, of course, Anand. You, you highlighted it, I think, in the introduction, which is you know, diabetes is a condition we now know maybe as many as 40 different disorders. Each of them have very different responses to medication, to nutrition, and also environment in lots of different ways. And in many instances, a lot of the data we've collected in uh, clinical trials is in very circumspect, usually very uniform populations, typically uh, of very limited ethnic diversity. And we haven't really thought about how we optimize care locally, optimize for individual ethnicities, individual environments, individual diets. And one of the problems, I think, with medicine is that typically data collection has been about us, the physicians, and the research is almost off in a separate space. And in almost every other industry in our lives, there, the systems that we use are learning in real time, whether it's finance or travel the systems are actually actively learning. And uh, I think Ramesh mentioned this in, in his comments and in the introduction that a lot of the data we collect and Cash emphasized that uh, a lot of the data we collect uh, are really not necessarily relevant to the individual. They're about the system and not about the problem that the individual subject has. And so one of the things I think we really need to think about is how do we collect data that are computable at source how do we make sure that the data we're collecting are part of the care delivery so we understand how patients are responding to care? And how do we close the loop so that the systems that we're building are learning in real time? And you know, we find this, for example, in a uh, we built a platform in Appman Health to deliver diabetes, lipid, and hypertension care. We find that in even just slightly non-traditional populations, as many as 30% of the subjects had no response at all to the first five or six levels of uh, guideline-directed therapy. You needed to be in the seventh or eighth tier therapy. And the system was able to learn that in four to six weeks, uh, which um, essentially the medical community had not seemed to be able to learn over the previous uh, 10 to 15 years. We need to build platforms that deliver care and learn at the same time. And I think, uh, as, as you pointed out, the heterogeneity of individual patient responses is really what demands this. Our ability to drive the best treatment, even the, the things that we know work, work differently at individual patient level. How do we build systems that deliver that uh, at the scale necessary to essentially allow everybody to be able to get the best care for them uh, at the right time in the right place? And I think that's really the, the core problem here is how do we build research that operates not just for the tiny number of subjects that get into a clinical trial, but for the whole population. I think the last thing I'll say is, I think COVID has really taught us this. 900 million to a billion people have been infected with this disease. Maybe as many as 6 million people have died. And all of the quantitative information about the disease has come from 10,000 patients, 5,000 in the UK, 5,000 in Israel, Everybody else, their information was thrown away. And that's basically the core problem, that the data we collect in medicine, we don't actually use. And if we find a way to research in real time, in the real world, using the real data from our own patients, we'd be able to transform medicine in the way that other industries have been transformed in the last 10 to 15 years. That's fantastic uh, setup, Callum. One, uh, one question I want to ask before we move to Sanjay, and that is, uh, when you say that every individual behaves differently, how, how serious is that difference? Meaning, uh, and I wanted to add a comment I want to saw from Dayanavi from Ramesh the other day, where he said that even one individual uh, every month or every few days may behave differently in some sense. So the, the individualization of this data person, the need for personalized stuff, uh, can you comment a bit on that as well? Very much so. So even if you just take simple metrics like the time from a meal at which your glucose gets elevated, 
there are at least six different dominant patterns identified worldwide. And there are probably many more, but if you just look at that one variable, when your sugar goes up after a meal, and so that immediately changes the timeline of medications, the types of medications, the way those medications are deployed. But as you point out, even the individual meals themselves can actually end up having different responses in different people. And we just haven't built platforms that allow us to refine what we're doing at the right level of resolution. So as Ramesh said, medicine is episodic. You know, many uh, diabetic patients are seeing their physician once every three to six months. They're not getting meal by meal input. We need to build platforms that allow us to be able to inform the individual and how to control the, themselves, to empower them uh, to manage their own lives in in conjunction with their physicians so that we get the best possible outcomes. But it's a real problem. So it's hugely important, for example, even in terms of the use of oral hypoglycemic agents, the use of insulin, how do you time insulin? When do you time it? Those are all, a determ all determined by just simply that one function. And that's one of many different aspects of diabetic care. Thanks, Callum, for setting this up. Now I'm gonna try Sanjay one more time, Sanjay. You sort of represent the doctor community in India, and we have all these kinds of things. People do. You are all so busy that you know it's very hard for patients. Watching every meal and responding is probably impossible from the doctor's point of view. What do you think is happening, and what is your uh, comment on this particular problem? How hard is this problem we are trying to solve? We can't hear you, Sanjay. No, not yet. You're mute as well. Yeah, unmuted. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yes, yes, very much. Clearly. <laughs> no problem.
Hey, wonderful. I think uh, Callum already shared a little bit about the complexity of the problem. You have broadened that problem by not only saying it's complex on an individual level, the scale is also an issue, meaning there are just a lot of people to be dealt with. And you also talked about the complexity of data, saying that we have all these data sets which need to be longitudinal, individuals need to manage it. So you have made this problem so complex, maybe we can never solve it. But that's why we have a visionary here in our group and that is Ramesh. So I'm going to just move to Ramesh and then to Cash saying, uh, I know we'll get there eventually, but can you a little bit paint the future or the art of the possible in some form to say that with these kinds of problems that the doctors are asking, do you technologists have a way to solve this problem? And what would that be? So let me ask Ramesh to go first and then Cash to talk about that. And then we'll try to bring it all together after we have heard from both of, both of you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, you heard both from Kalam uh, uh, and Sanjay uh, the complexity of the problem. Uh, you heard the data and uh, how the data is collected, how the data is dimension used. Let me add one more dimension to that. Uh, one of the most important thing that we forget is that we are all a system and every system works well when we work in closed loop form. We all know that our body has uh, uh, the most important function is homeostasis. When homeostasis is not working properly, then only you run into all kinds of these chronic problems and you try to augment homeostasis, either using medicine or using some other things. Now, can we, and we have seen in diabetes that for type one, now we have uh, continuous glucose monitoring combined with the pump. Uh, effectively, what we did is that this problem that was affecting so many people and making their life and their parents' life uh, miserable, we had put a simple closed loop uh, uh, system there to augment the homeostasis and uh, that it's changing their lives completely. The question is, can we do that to everybody uh, who comes close to this kind of situation. Can we build a control loop system? That means a closed loop system. What that means is that we are collecting the data. We all are using variable devices. Continuous glucose monitoring is increasingly becoming more important and uh, uh, possibly uh, Callum will know this more that uh, possibly in five to 10 years, it will be affordable by, for normal uses also. So for the, uh, given this kind of situation that uh, we are getting in, it is very easy to uh, collect the data continuously and implement a closed loop. The closed loop can be implemented only when we also analyze the behavior of people who are using this system because it is the most difficult part in medicine or in any other field is behavior sense. It is very easy to say, stop eating this thing and start eating this thing or take medicine this time or do exercise this time. Do people do it? How are you going to motivate them or how are you going to do this? Uh, Closed loop system will allow you to monitor what kind of uh, approaches can work on them and what will not work on them. So uh, th these are th some other dimensions that we have to start uh, bringing in there. Anand, you mentioned about uh, Dianavi. Uh, one of the things that we started in Dianavi right from the beginning was, how can we implement this uh, closed loop system so that we are providing people feedback right from the time that they start using the system. Initially, we don't have the personal model so we start using the population model as a generalized personal model. But as we start collecting the data, we start using the personal model. Luckily, within 10 days to two weeks, we have enough information about the person that we can start advising them uh, enough about them. So my th the thing is, yes, we can implement all these things. We will have to build a, control, a complete closed loop control system or as they call cybernetic systems. Perfect, Ramesh. Thanks for setting this up. So you, again, this is very interesting, Callum. Focus on the individual and the personal. You kept that thing. Uh, Sanjay did the job of scaling it out. Cash, you run like a huge 
um, healthcare system, every individual's data, you want to bring it together. Can you talk a little bit about doing this at scale and your big data and all the other stuff that you work on to make this possible at scale? And what do you think is possible? Well, let's say if you were to just do some crystal balling 10 years from now to five years from now. Well, uh, the sad thing is, right, the uh, technology to, you know, Dr. you talked about um, the, the data not being sharing, the pre and post, and you only have an instance of that patient visit sort of data. You know, you don't have this sort of historical sort of trends, right? Let me just start with um, the technology to do all of this exists today, right? The technology to collect the data, the technology to understand the history, the technology to understand the past, to engage the patient, the glucose monitoring. I mean, there's conversations on diabetes vaccines and, 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 and transplants, the, the pancreas, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think fundamentally, you know, if I was king for a day, as one of my mentors has sort of used that phrase and I've caught on to it. If I was king for a day, I would try and it's something that's happening in the US, right? We, we all got EMRs and everybody got their data electronically. Nobody wanted to share. And the federal government here is forcing now institutions and health systems to share the data, right, at a, at a national level. It's happening. It hasn't happened just yet, but it's beginning to happen. I do think this is where the opportunity in India lies, right, is if we can get the, the from an institutional mandate perspective to share the data and make it be identified. I get it, everybody doesn't want it, and there's privacy concerns, there's the IT concerns, right? But the technology to share that data into a standard model exists today. These models have been developed for quite some time, they're pretty stable, they're understood. The world of research understands this, right? And so every single hospital, institution, in the city, in the communities, if they were collecting all of this diabetic data, India actually has a pretty decent national identity system. Um, if we can convert that patient medical, connect that patient's medical record to that identity system in a form where it's by, by a trusted broker, that's where the legislation pressure sort of has to exist because the technology exists at all. And I do believe if we can begin to do that, then, then we can start to, to really jump on what Ramesh is talking about, about this sort of closed loop system sort of idea that we would truly um, have, have an ability to track that patient, have, have an ability to create um, engaging sort of models for, for, for behavior change, right, to, 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 to get that sort of feedback over time. So I think that's where the, um, the pressure has to be. If, the, if the, the legislation was there, you can come and knock on my door and I can sit down with a bunch of engineers and store them and do the same. But the data, the, the technology exists to put all of this stuff together. What I'm doing here at Hackensack is trying to build that in a sort of, in a way that we can then sort of replicate it from one institution to another to another. Um, and then five years from now, if that exists, the trust is there, it's the identified, would start to naturally form a pretty cohesive, large set of data. I think the magical answer in this, all of this is to ensure the data, the other part in healthcare, the data is not as high quality. And so we would have to think about the increase in the quality by um, using standard models, standard ontologies, trying to clean up the data, et cetera, et cetera. But there's sort of mechanical problems. But I think the legislation pushed centralize the data would be key. That's sort of my takeaway from this. Thanks a lot, Cash. I think uh, we've set this up uh, very optimistically from the techies. The techies believe that this can be a problem we can solve in the next ten five years. years. So 10 years. Ten yeah, years. okay. <laughs> 10 years. Great. So uh, it's good to hear that. I think it's good to know that there is hope for, you, for us, at least in the US side of things. I'm going to push it back to Sanjay and say that, Sanjay, you have a you are in India right now where people have uh, lots of doctors all over the place. Patient to doctor ratios are such that all the busy doctors treat hundreds of patients on an hour and all kinds of stuff. People are not collecting data on their own. Cost of all these things can be high. Quality of data is poor. Do you think we have any hope? How can we get started? And I want to start by this Chinese proverb that people talk a lot about that say that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years back. Yes, we should have done this 20 years back. But if that's not done, the next best time is now. So Sanjay, can you comment a little bit on the community that is attending this conference? How willing and how motivated are we to collect data across the groups? And if you think that can be done, then potentially what Ramesh is saying and what Cash is saying, possibly we have a way out. And some of the problems that you and Callum have set up might have actually a solution here.
I just say this. That's one. Number two, we don't have any way by which, you know, like we had, uh, both of us were talking with a lot of people about the I2B system that was there. We don't have at the moment any system by which data can be shared on one platform with each other so that I can lend in a proper manner the data so that somebody all puts in the data and becomes a more, you know, all, uh, complete compilation of data for making some analysis out of it. So while there is a inertia on giving data, there is also is a fact a lot of apprehension about data that comes in the public domain or maybe a more close group domain that is there. And the third is the quality of data that, you know, we are giving is also a concern that even if I give the data, will it have any sort of a meaningful, uh, require meaningful use out of it all to somebody who's making something out of it. So this is where the problem lies that we don't have enough intelligence about it. We don't have enough awareness about it. And I think we need to start small, have group of people who can share data like the I2B2 that we talked about earlier. And once that works, the model works very well, then go outwards and see that more and more people join this. RSSDI, which, of which I'm the secretary, and IDEC, which I'm the chair, these are sort of bodies that can make it possible. Because if we start using it from our bodies, people think that, yes, we have already gone through all the nuances of making sure that this is safe and we can give data to such bodies and they will be protected in every kind of a way. So I think bodies like ours should take up the cause and make people aware about the importance of data. And for that, we need to have platforms created by you to see that how can we make this easily available for people to load their data onto and that yet have the security that that data is not going to be misused in any kind of a way. in different forms. So Callum, I know you've been working with a fairly broad uh, BWH system and you have data from other hospitals and other people and you're part of many research groups where you have collaborated with data for other people. So what is your uh, guidance to India and to RSSDI and to IDEC? And what should we be our thinking? So that's one. While you answer that, I want to also pu push one more thing in it. So there is this other discussion that I've been part of where everyone says, okay, just collect all the data and then we will figure it out, right? The reality is that it will take years to collect all the data. And after we have collected it, we might find out that we have only collected garbage, right? So how do we ensure that we are doing incremental progress and we have the ability to collect and use the data while it's being still collected? Because we'll never have it perfect at any one time, but still good can be done with incrementally improving quality of data. So if you can comment a bit on that, Callum, and then I want to take Cash's view on it because he also deals with uh, millions of patients of this kind. So I, I think, you know, I agree with everything uh, that Ramesh and Cash and Sanjay have said so far. I think there are a couple of things that I think are worth pointing out. One is that the majority of patients are actually willing to give other data from their lives routinely if they get something of value in return. And I think one of the things that we need to really ask ourselves is why do we treat healthcare data so differently? Well, it's partly because we get nothing of value in return. And so the, the, the one thing I think is missing from all of this. So actually, one other thing I want to say is I think India has a unique opportunity. India has led the way in, in things like microfinance, the ability to build things at scale, the, the uh, incredible diversity of the Indian population, the, the uh, ability of India to adopt technologies in ways that other countries have not managed. I think as Cash alluded to and Ramesh has also mentioned, really is, is at the forefront. There's an opportunity for India to do something transformative and to then bring it to other parts of the world. I think that's totally true because the resistance to change is different. There's an innovative culture and there's also somewhat less structure to break down before you can replace it with something new. But the one thing I think that's missing oftentimes in many of these deployments is, is actually transacting on the data that you bring in. And this is what you were alluding to, Anand, I think, when you said we can collect data for 20 years, but then all we have is really a pile of data. 
what we need to understand a system, to understand the human system, to understand the healthcare system, is to understand how to transact within it. And that's the, I think the entire message of closed loop approaches is you're continuously optimizing uh, and you can do that at local or uh, global uh, optima. You don't need to, to basically wait for 20 years to, to end up uh, with an improvement. And I think in order to do that, you need actual clinical care to be tightly coupled to the data that you collect. You need to know, these are the data I collected. This is what I did with the data. This is the output. And then iterate on that cycle. And what we've seen is when we do that, we start to learn in very rapid uh, succession. We start to build increments that they may not necessarily change our understanding of the disease within weeks, but what they do is they change our ability to manage the disease within weeks. They change the workflow within weeks. They change uh, the cost of care delivery within weeks. And that I think is really something super important to make sure that we're considering is how do you build systems that actually transact on the data? I mean, for example, when we looked at the Harvard uh, primary care networks, uh, there are 5,000 primary care doctors in the Harvard system. There are 4,800 choices of the first two drugs in diabetes. So unless you standardize the inputs, you're never gonna be able to learn anything mean meaningful about the output. So I completely agree with everything that Ramesh and Cash and Sanjay said about standardizing data collection, but you also need to have some form of standardization of the transactions that you make on those types of data that you collect. And I think until we get that right, until we collaborate around that, uh, we're, we're, we're less able to learn at the speed where everybody feels like they're getting some benefit from it. The patients, the physicians at the systems, all need to see upside in a very short space of time. And that can only only really happen if we're all working together uh, to do this in concert. But I totally agree with Sanjay that starting uh, with a really solid base of rigorous data collection and then thinking about how you build the systems to transact on that is really important. That's how we built uh, Atman Health. That's what we're trying to do inside the Harvard system. And I, I believe it's it's what Cash is trying to do. It's what Ramesh is trying to do. I think there, there have to be ways for us all to work together to do this at the scale that's necessary. You know, you look at every other industry and there are hundreds of millions of transactions a day flowing in, improving the outcomes in everything from Uber to visas fraud detection. In healthcare, everything is local and hyper-local at that. So there's almost no meaningful information. It's one physician, one provider. And to some extent, that's us that have set that up. The physicians have resisted thinking about how to systematize the bits that we know how to do. And I think in the long run, what we need to do as physicians is give up some control to the patient and to the system of the things that we know that work so that we can spend our professional time working on the areas where it's much less clear and where actually cognitive input from the physician is really an important contributor. And if we get that balance right, uh, I think we'll all uh, see some uh, significant upside. Amazing, uh, very good, Callum. I think one other important point you made, which I want to reemphasize with the fact that I think as patients who contribute the data or medical practitioners who bring that data through their patients, what do you get for it is the fundamental key question and not answering that is uh, not going to solve any problem. So that's a question we must answer before we go too far. So Cash, maybe you have yeah, some okay. comments on this. Before you go to Cash, yeah, can, okay, can I? Yeah, yeah, sure, support? Ramesh. Yeah, yeah, Ramesh, go ahead. I, can, I want to support very strongly this point that Callum made that uh, people are willing to share their data. People are interested in sharing their data if they know that it's going to benefit others and they are not going to be harmed. Okay? Uh, the whole idea of privacy is an uh, artificial problem for most people. If we can manage privacy in a way that uh, uh, we can deal with it without harming people, I think more and more people will be willing to share that. And I'm sure Cass will tell you that uh, uh, we haven't done much work in that area, but that is something that can be solved. Thanks. Well, now, Ramesh, you just hit it on the, on the head, and I think, honestly, just the thing to, to I think, IDEX, you have an opportunity as an organization to act as that trusted broker here. And so, so let me sort of, you know, back up a little. We talk about the data trust, and we want to share the data. It's my data. I can make money from it, you know, or fix at harm. 
there, the, the technology exists where we can put the data into a bucket. Somebody, the trusted broker, can take that data and then sanitize it, right? Make it safe, be identified. But as part of that process, you know, what Kyle and Ramesh said, we can increase the quality of it by, by, by creating standards, by creating ontologies, right? Creating quality markers around that data as it sort of comes in. So it's not a large container of spaghetti, right? But if you create that, and you also take, take into mind, let's not worry, let's not sure world hunger. Let's not sort of say we're going to get all data on all patients about all diseases, right? We're going to focus on diabetes. We're going to focus on this cohort of diabetes. Maybe it's type 1, maybe it's type 2, maybe it's some particular kind. And we start to build those use cases, um, you know, one piece at a time, and we start to build a discipline. I think I just sitting on opportunities. It can be the trusted broker to bring that data in, people like Ramesh and Callum and myself, on the engineering side can help with the models and I think, by the way, it makes me cringe as an engineer, by the way, but that's a personal story. Um, but there are lots of interesting models out there that can help us ingest the data to scale. The technology definitely exists. But that discipline, I think the, um, the IDEC has an opportunity to become that um, trusted rover. Once we've got the data set, once we've got the data set, then we can start to combine all the other interesting data sets that we talk about, right? The social data, the environmental data, the diet data, the behavioral data, which is actually pretty freely available. Inference data, marketing data, that stuff is pretty freely available. Um, like people share that without thinking about it. So I think creating that trusted broker, the quality, you know, field and the quality and, and creating the right sort of phenotype and the right ontologies will give us clean data. Once we get clean data, then we like then we let the you know let loose the likes of Callum and others to do their magic and what they do. So I think that's an opportunity if we're sort of thinking forward um, what what um, your organisation could do uh, institutionally in the country. Yeah, and we also watching the clock here. We have about thirty minutes to go. Uh, Sanjay, uh, one quick question, just a logistics one: Is it going to be possible to get any questions from the audience, or is that not something we should consider? Uh, I don't think we'll be able to get the questions from the audience because it's not figured that way. So we'll continue. Okay, that's fine. But I'll keep collecting the questions at my end uh, as and when I receive it. Perfect. So before uh, we get into the next part of this uh, conversation where I want to go to one of the questions I would like to ask Callum and Cash and to Sanjay to some extent as well. See, on one side, it feels good to collect CGM and hundreds of data points across uh, individual, but... Uh, now, consider the group that we have listening to this out of India. Uh, is there some basic data that can we get started? You know, is it necessary to have everyone to have CGMs and uh, continuous monitoring of hundreds of parameters? Because that would pretty much make things very difficult. So if you were to say 101, step one, we don't have anything, we want to get started, uh, and we have all these doctors attending, can we sort of, can you give us some guidelines on the basic stuff that we can start with in the version 1.0 for the first six months, and then we can incrementally keep increasing the quality and the quantity of data we collect. So is it possible to collect few things to start with and then keep increasing that? Or how would you recommend we go about this at national scale? Yeah, I mean, I I can take that to start with. I think I think one of the things in medicine we we have done for many decades, maybe even centuries, is imagine that the information that we collect is somehow special. And I think one of the things that we're beginning to recognize is a lot of the information that people collect on themselves in their daily lives is actually quite important. So simple things like the time you get up, the time you go to bed, uh, how much walking you do, uh, your weight on a more regular basis, what you eat, those types of things can, if they're able to be collected in a systematic way, be very helpful. Um, I think, uh, you know, for example, we found when uh, we were looking at a heart failure study that the best predictor of readmission was none of the variables that we thought were important as cardiologists. It was actually uh, telephone chatter. It was whether people were calling their relatives more or less, because that was actually a better index uh, of how they felt than any other metric. So if you knew roughly what their telephone call uh, uh, frequency was of the duration of their calls beforehand. That was a better predictor than even measuring the pressures in their heart in real time with a sensor. And I think we're going to find lots of other examples like that. I think uh, medicine is highly underdetermined. We need to start to bring in a lot of new data 
and we can't afford to have every piece of that data be validated in a clinical trial. We need to be able to collect information on everybody where they are. And if that's your telephone use, if it's the uh, time you spend driving, if it, whatever it is, I think it'll end up being important. But there are some basic metrics for, that are disease specific for sure that are super important for us to collect. But in many instances, they're very simple things done well reproducibly. And you can actually train people to do that themselves. I mean, we, we've we seen efforts in the past to have people trained to take their pulse in the morning when they get up and sit on the edge of their bed. Those types of things over time can be really useful. Daily weights, really useful. Um, actually, one other example, we spent a lot of time working with a, a scale company on heart failure predictors. Again, the best index was not their weight was not their cardiac output, was not their ECG, it was their balance on the scale. So when you actually are sick, you find it more difficult to balance on the scale than you do when you're well. That ended up being the best predictor of readmission. So I think we just need to be much more uh, circumspect and open and thinking about the data that are important. And so a lot of the existing data that people are collecting on their phones, uh, any other devices they have, they don't have to be medical devices, anything in their own lives can actually end up being really important. And then the one other thing I would add is I think building communities that look after each other is super important and finding ways to have communities measure each other uh, is also super uh, critical in this, whether it's uh, people recognizing their relatives or their uh, family, or other uh, community members of uh, being sick. That type of surveillance is actually something that already takes place in other settings. We need to think about how we collect that information for healthcare as well. Anand, can I come in for a minute? Yes, uh, I'm going to come to you, Sanjay, in a minute. Uh, I, just I want was to going ask to ask a question to Callum for a minute. So, I yeah, just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask you that, you know, the problem that we have is uh, the healthcare professionals work in a one silo and the technologists work in another silo. And the both of them have hardly any interaction with each other. And how is it possible to bring both these together to see that, you know, at the end of the day, both need, need each other if something has to be made meaningful out of it? How did you make a successful model to see that the healthcare professional as well as the technologists, you know, came together and, you know, made something out of what you did the, in your Harvard system? Well, I think, I think Cash mentioned it very directly. It's having an honest broker. And I think IDEC has the opportunity to do this. There are multiple opportunities, uh, I think, in the Indian community to, to think about how to configure it. But it's having an honest broker where literally you're just creating a sandbox where the technologists and the physicians, and I think importantly, the patients, all work together to work out how to build a system that works for everybody. And that's essentially what we did. We built a... Uh, a, a very open um, area, uh, a, an innovation center that uh, Anand has seen, where we literally allowed uh, technologists uh, and clinicians and patients to work cheek by jowl so that they could actually build things that were different. And one of the things we tried to do was also, I think one of the things that we've seen is uh, physicians tend to build for physicians, technologists build for mm -hmm. technologists. We all want to be building for patients. That's what we have to try and do. And breaking down some of those barriers will be the single most important thing. Sanjay, I want to add one thing here, and then I want you to share a little bit about the grand experiments that you have done about getting a million people to give their data and all of that. Uh, but uh, one of the things I wanted to mention here is that Sanjay and I, and I've been on a mission right now on the focus predominantly to say that I'm trying to build four communities together and trying to bring them together. One is the medical community that Sanjay is part of, which is through the RSSDI. I have a pretty good network amongst the IIT data communities across the country, which is the techies of the world. And uh, Sanjay is aware of that. We've had several meetings where we have gotten some of the people who are doing work in these IITs to think about problems at scale from the RSSDI point of view. The third group we have been interacting with is the government in India because they actually are responsible for grants and various other things. And considering this magnitude of the problem, getting them to be playing a role has been very critical. And I've been also trying to do my bit to collect philanthropists to come together who are open to saying, can we solve these large problems together? 
So I think uh, we, uh, at least from my side, I've been for the last one and a half to two years working on this community building, both on the diabetes side and on cancer side to try to bring these four communities together and see how can we bring everyone together. And this is part of the discussion we are going to have with Sanjay and the rest of the team as well. But before we go further, and I'd like Cash and uh, Ramesh to chip in here, and this sort of maybe the last theme that we focus on. And I wanted uh, Sanjay to share a little bit about the grand uh, million people challenges that he has done after. Uh, so let me get Cash and Ramesh to say something. And Sanjay, I would like you to sort of finish off by the grand experiments that you have done about getting data from millions of people and see how we can take that forward. And then finally, I want to conclude with, okay, so what's next? How can we work together and how can we get things to happen? And I'm, I'm watching the clock as well. So, so I want to promise everyone we'll finish at nine. You can exceed 10 uh, minutes to cover up the time. No, 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 asked. let's not. No, Sanjay, everyone has other things going on. <laughs> so we should finish on time. No problem. So Cash and uh, Ramesh, can you chip in if you have anything to say on this topic? So um, uh, you're on mute, right? So I'll just quickly start. Um, so on the on the sort of what can we do tomorrow? I think um, just echoing what Callum was saying is, is it might be easier and simpler to start to capture patient reported data. Uh, in India, you know, I get the challenges. Every these systems are different. The, the technology is different. The sharing is not there. Lots of smaller institutions. So flipping the sort of coin, as it were, and thinking about capturing, you know, the, the patient generated data. There's a huge audience very um, you know, aware with cell phones, right? Um, and, and the availability of having those devices that are attached to the hip. And I think getting the patients trained and educated, maybe an app, maybe you know, um, some sort of behavioral change incentivized, but there's an awful lot of data to what Callum was saying that's available um, easily. So that might be a really good way to sort of accelerate that sort of data capturing piece. That's where I would start in the short term, um, because the other ones are gonna take a little longer to do, right? The legislation, the technology, the sharing, but the patient reported ones is where I would sort of start in the, in the short term. Ramesh? Ramesh, you want to add anything? Yes. Uh, the, the, I think the difficulty of uh, finding right people uh, was much more challenging, uh, I would say, 10 years ago than it is now. They are, I run into lots and lots of doctors uh, who are practicing doctors, but they are so much aware of the data issues that it's kind of mind boggling. And uh, similarly, lots of technical people are becoming uh, increasingly interested in some of these things. Uh, coming back to a little bit about the data, one issue that we did not address, particularly given that we are talking about diabetes, is related to food issues because food is uh, clearly the most important uh, item here. And in addition to the technical problems and the uh, chemical problems with respect to food, I think the bigger problem in every country and particularly sl slightly more serious in India is the amount of disinformation that is there about food. When I talk to lots of actors, in nutrition area uh, and most of the time I hear the term that 90% of the information that is available about food is disinformation. What can we do to improve this situation could be a very important contribution to things like diabetes or many other chronic diseases because ultimately we all have been talking about how important is lifestyle for these diseases and uh, in lifestyle, more than 50% is food. And you brought up a very important point, Ramesh. And in India, as you know, uh, you know, we have all kinds of variety <laughs> and yeah. complexity that makes it very difficult. So, Sanjay, I want you to comment a little bit on the million uh, people thing that you did and just to share that as an example. And then my suggestion was that if you are looking at some of these. What does the next million dollar experiment that you are trying out could look like? And is there a way to uh, take some help on some of the items we should track? So uh, before I start, I just want to introduce you to Dr. K. M. Prasanna Kumar. He's from Bangalore and he has Hello, doctor. been uh, part of the from the inception of RSSDI and he gets the IDEC Medal of Honor this today. Uh, for his exemplary work in type 1 diabetes and so many other areas. 
So uh, we are very privileged and proud, privileged to have you with us uh, today. And I'm going to ask him two minutes also to contribute his, you know, thoughts about this. But I'll just take this forward as to what you mentioned. Uh, last year, we we realized that less than 30% of the people actually, or about 30% of the people test their blood sugars. And we realized a large population of people don't even know that they have diabetes because they've never tested their blood sugars. Given that fact, we wanted to create a countrywide awareness that can we make people aware to just test their blood sugar once at least, so that if they test their blood sugar, at that point of time, maybe we will pick up undiagnosed diabetes. And we know that across the board, about 57% of the people know that, uh, are, are, do not know that they have diabetes. So given that, we started a campaign of awareness and we touched 100, in 100 days 128 million people through social awareness, uh, print, media, or you know, TV channels, and we created an awareness program. Not only that, in one single day, with the help of Rotary Foundation and other you know, NGOs, we tested blood glucose of one million people in a single day. And we had some basic information collection that we did on that, that particular day, where we talked about the BMIs, their you know, random blood sugars, and some of the other parameters. So that entire data that has been collected has been now given to the biostatisticians to interpret and tell us what will come out of it. So we've had some uh, you know, interim data, but we're waiting for the full data analysis to really publish that. Going forwards on that, we uh, this year have started Save the Feet, Keep Walking campaign, and that's in the progress right now. The idea was that people with diabetes tend to have uh, feet issues and you know a lot of people lose feet because of either you know bad management missing out you know good care uh, you know they have amputations deformities which makes life difficult for them so we wanted to see that people get aware of the fact that they should look at their feet doctors should get aware of the fact that they need to look at people's feet to see that you know we can pick up feet at risk early and you know we can save feet in the long run so that was the whole campaign to say, save the feet, keep walking. And we've done this, we've created an online platform of data collection of you know, how people present to us in the clinics. And we're trying to see that you know, with that entire data that we're collecting, can we make some interpretation out of it? It's a month long campaign and we are last week into that campaign. And till now we've had about 20,000 people who have been tested from all across the country. There are about 9,000 doctors who have signed up for this, and we have collected a data of 20,000 people in terms of their feet, uh, you know, uh, looking at their feet. So we are hoping that, you know, we'll get at least about 30,000 people whose feet would have been examined by all across the country. So we're trying to see that, you know, these meaningful awareness programs can not only give us awareness, but also, you know, give us some data to see that, you know, when we look at large, population that we are studying that can we make some interpretation out of this for the future. I'm going to just ask Dr. Prasada Kumar to also chip in and ask us. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay and Dr. Anand Deshpande. My view is our talk is data capture and analysis. How do you capture data? Less than 3% of tertiary care have any EMR. Without EMR, to capture data at one point has no meaning. I want vertical data as such. And not to talk of secondary and tertiary care, it hardly exists. So we should have EMR, because I have been using more than two decades, then data capture will be perfect. Next thing is uniformity in data. If you do not have uniformity in capturing data, it will be trash in and trash out. In a country where probably more than 70 million population have diabetes, you say I capture 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. What does it matter? And what are you picking up? Tertiary care, not even secondary and primary. 90% of diabetes care in India is in primary care. If you do not do it, then the data, whatever you say is represent, is skewed. It does not matter to me at all. Then the question of analysis and all. So do we have an EMR? And unless it is made mandatory, whether you are primary, secondary, tertiary care, Outpatient, it is abysmally low. I have seen my colleagues even tertiary care. And talking to what Dr. Anand said about the government, yes, digitalization of the health. Nobody knows what digitalization. 
and is it voluntary or compulsory? They may ask just like your age, sex, blah, blah, and other things. Are you diabetic? Yes or no. It is voluntary. Then what about those who are not voluntary? What data you will capture? And it depends. Many people may not even disclose. There, there's a huge problem telling that we are going to get data. Every patient will not happen unless it is compulsory and mandatory. Where, let us say, cancer registry and others where it happened and some infectious disease. Unless we have it, another 10, 20 years we'll be discussing same. We'll not be able to keep one society, one organization, 5,000 doctors, where there are probably 150,000 doctors, where you capture 5,000 doctors. And that to a tertiary care, it doesn't mean anything to me. Whether standard of care, analysis, complication, management, everything. I think we should have a system in place and then only talk about collecting data, analysis. Otherwise, it's small islands of excellence and here and there, you are not representing the country. This is what I feel problem last two to three decades. Thank you for your attention. Um, any of you want to make any final comments, Callum, Ramesh, and Cash? And then I'd like to summarize and then uh, put it to next steps and then hand it to the Sanjay for closing. I'd just like to say that, you know, I think all the problems we've discussed tonight are global. And I think India has a, a unique role and possibility to help solve many of these uh, for the global community and exciting to be part of this discussion and look forward to collaborating in any way that I can with the community in India and more broadly to help solve some of these issues. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to participate. It's an honor and a pleasure. Cash. Then we can yeah, get I think, uh, in order for something big to happen, these are really major problems, right? If, if less than you know, three percent of primary care has no electronic system, how can we capture data? Right? We talked about the variety. Of so what I'm saying is something major and something disruptive has to happen, and, and typically disruption at this scale happens has to happen from a, a legislation perspective. So some regulatory body has to come in, incentivize, change, enforce, support, encourage, invest. In, in a fundamental change. So that's sort of what I'm hearing, and, and I think we need to find a way of uh, making that happen. Thanks, Cash. Ramesh? Uh, at the beginning of this century, we saw a very interesting thing happen. Uh, many countries did not have any uh, communication infrastructure. We did not have landlines. And then came the mobile phones. And all of a sudden, we saw that many countries who did not have uh, any communication infrastructure, they empowered all the people in their countries with uh, communication abilities. Not only that, but many of them started becoming leader in uh, applications on these mobile phones. Okay. I think some of the problems that we have discussed and we were talking about uh, Indian situation fall exactly in that kind of uh, situation. Uh, we just heard from uh, Dr. Prasanna uh, uh, the it, it, it issues that we face and everybody talks about we not having the, this device and that device and the uh, uh, data standards not being there. But uh, Anand, you have been involved in uh, seeing how Aadhaar was uh, launched and uh, has been quite successful. If uh, uh, in a country Aadhaar-like system can be implemented, uh, then uh, I think uh, we can do lots of things. And uh, many of the things that we consider as a problem that we are facing in India, and they can uh, become really our strength in the sense that we will know how to solve those problems. And believe me, every country has those problems. Most of the countries have those problems. And uh, if we uh, consider this problem as an opportunity, as uh, uh, the Chinese proverb says, so uh, Anand, I'm following you again, quoting China, that uh, there is no problem, there are only opportunities. So let's consider these to be opportunities. And it goes without saying that uh, I'm very interested in working with this. I started uh, already working with some institutions there. And I would be very happy to work with uh, anybody who wants to work on these problems. Thank you. Perfect. And before I hand it back to Raya Sanjay, let me make a few comments to close this discussion. So first, uh, thank you all for being part of this session. I have learned a lot from this. I hope all of you benefited from this session as well. Uh, like Ramesh, I tend to be very 
I am an optimist and I believe that we will solve these problems uh, in due course of time. I've been part of the Aadhaar system as a board member. I've been also part of iSpirit and UPI and various other things that have happened, including the bank accounts that we have increased for us. So, so it is possible to do these kinds of things at grand scale in India. And I must say, having worked with Sanjay for the last two years, I find RSSDI is a very progressive organization and we have an opportunity here to disrupt. And what I'm trying to do along with Sanjay is to bring my network along with his network. And my network is mostly on the technology side and some of the international people that we have in this call. And I'm really delighted that you have agreed to work with us on this. I think uh, we have a plan that uh, is being worked out. Sanjay can perhaps share it during the conference, but we want to see how to build registries, how to build research, federated research data set, so that you know we can start with incremental problems and keep increasing the complexity of how we get through them. Um, thank you all in the audience for being in here as well. And since I think it's best that we end locally while Sanjay is in person, I'm going to hand it to Sanjay and Sanjay. Um, I'd like you to thank, thank you also for being part of this and uh, your concluding remarks and we close this session. Thank you very much, Anand. And I would like to thank each of the panelists for sparing time and being with us today. I think the entire dis uh, discussion has been very insightful. And uh, I think it's now time for action and we have to look for the future. Whatever has been the past has been a learning for us to think that what we should, you know, do for the future. And unless we start, you know, re-looking at this entire journey of how we can now look uh, the integration of digital with digital health in our own clinical practice, it's going to be difficult for each one of us to function and make, you know, better care systems for the uh, for the patients. So I think we need to all get together, the technologists, the healthcare professionals, all of us have to work and not stay in individual silos. And uh, I think come together and see that, you know, can we make models of care in terms of prevention as well as, you know, better care so that our patients can benefit in the long run. So with this, I would like to close the session and thank each one of you for being part of this panel. Thank you so much for your journey. Thank you.